These are Idaho 7 wet hops. And by wet hop meaning they were just harvested. Um, hops are usually dried, pelletized, and a lot of the vegetal material is removed to make them shelf stable and to remove a lot of the unwanted parts, a lot of like the extra vegetal material like I was mentioning. The cool thing is, is hops are harvested over about a month and a half period in um, like late August to basically the end of September. And that's all of the hop harvest in the Northern Hemisphere happens just during that one month time. So all the hops every brewery uses for the entire year is harvested over this time. A certain portion of those are sectioned off and they're used as wet hops. So these were harvested yesterday in Oregon, dropped on a uh, Southwest flight, and they're here. If we didn't use them, get them into beer today, they would mold and turn to crap. They're super perishable. Um, but when they're fresh, you even the pelletized version, nothing tastes quite like a wet hop does. Everyone gets really excited for them. They're also freaking terrible to use and a pain in the ass, so it's kind of nice that it's only once a year. So everything that we really want from the hops off of the center of the hop here is all the essential oils right off of the brachial. All the essential oils, the alpha acids, which are used in the boil kettle for bittering, and all of the aroma and flavor comes from the lupulin glands that are right at the base of the stem right there. All the rest of this organic material is pretty much not necessary. It's just part of the growth process. So when they're pelletized, the majority of this stuff is removed to concentrate down to just that ingredients right there. So what we're doing here is we're turning our mash tun into a giant hop back because it takes a large amount of these hops. This whole kettle will be full of about 200 pounds of fresh, wet Idaho 7 hops. Normally you start in the mash tun, you move it over to the boil to concentrate the solution. Gives you the opportunity to add bitterness to it as well, which is adding hops. Then normally we bring it down to fermentation temperature and send it to the cellar. But in this case, we're gonna go back to the mash tun. So that's just because it's the only vessel we have big enough that we can fit all of this like hot matter. Idaho 7 has some kind of juicy tropical notes. It has some stone fruit aroma to it and it also has kind of like a hint of Earl Grey or black tea in the background too. But the stone fruit and like the juicy fruitiness is what's the predominant flavor. To give you an idea of how perishable these are too, um, we were getting updates from Crosby in Oregon. It was raining this weekend so that was dependent upon when they could actually harvest. So they were giving us messages, hey, it's raining, we can't pull yet. Okay, it's ready to be pulled. You guys are gonna get them tomorrow. So it's uh, tight on everyone's schedule just because of how delicate they are. Have you guys developed that like uh, Wonka smell-o-vision yet? No? All right, because that would be a good time if you had that technology. These are definitely till the end of all the grain and growth season. These are big plump, plump cones. Closest familial relative is cannabis. So that should probably give you some idea what they smell like. This actually kind of looks like Columbus sort of too. That's the only other hop that I see get this fat. Normally we start with a mash and this is our mash tun. This is where we convert starches into sugars, make mash, and then it goes over to our boil kettle where we pasteurize and concentrate the solution. What we're doing today, because we're, it takes such a large hop load of wet hops, is we're filling our mash tun then and using it as a giant hop back. So once we're done with our boil, we're gonna send all of our wort back on top of all of these hop cones. The benefit that we have is that um, the mash tun is designed with a false bottom. So it's designed to leave the grain above and let all of the wort that we create in the normal mash fall through the bottom. So we're using that to keep the hop cones separate from the wort. So we'll splash the wort on top of it they're gonna pick up all this concentrated wet hop flavor. It's gonna fall through all of the cones and go through that um, false bottom at the bottom of the mash tun. It'll come back out through the bottom and then we'll knock it out normally and bring it down to fermentation temperature. So it's just a giant vessel that allows us to deal with this large <laughs> load of hops. And it allows us to save our equipment too because it keeps the hops from going into pumps and everything like that too. In a few minutes when the word hits it, you'll get a sensory overload of aroma. So those cones are then pressed. And this is what 
Idaho 7 looks like when we normally use it every other time of the year. It's about 50% lupulin, the essential oils, the alpha acids, beta acids, and then a little bit of the plant matter. And those are what's referred to as the T90 pellet. And they're basically like 50-50. By putting them in the pelletized form and keeping them in a vacuum sealed bag uh, that's also UV resistant, there's even like a uh, quantifiable degradation that the lab can tell you as like how your alpha acids fall off over time. It allows you to uh, really hone in the product that you're making. These are somewhat of a crapshoot but they taste really good once a year. It's the whole like uh, concept of blending to make a consistent batch. 90, probably 9% of breweries use strictly pellets. Uh, Sierra Nevada is one of the outliers that has a big whole cone hop room, but even those are slightly different than wet hops. Again, with uh, the moisture content of wet hops, they'll mold. So they go through a big drying process before they either are pelletized or packaged as whole cone dry hop. But Sierra Nevada is like one of the outliers that uses like majority whole cone hops for everything. There's a lot of uh, flavor that pick up with this vegetal material that I personally don't think is super desirable all the time. But the pellets just give you like a perfect consistent flavor. But there's nothing, they're nothing like the same. You could have a wet hop Idaho 7 and you could have like a single hopped Idaho 7 pellet and you might pick up some flavor characteristics, maybe some aroma, but they are gonna taste surprisingly different, which is why we all enjoy doing this for one month out of the year. I'm just getting ready to move the, the wort. I just chilled the 90C over onto all those hops. So I'm just moving hoses right now, but essentially we're gonna move 300, bar like 300 gallons of hot sugar water onto all of those like 200 pounds of hops to start isomerizing alpha acids and extract the hop like terpenes aromas. And then I brought it down to 90C basically to eliminate uh, DMS, which is dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl sulfide, which basically tastes like cream corn when it recondenses. So by bringing it down to 90, it will stop steaming as much so we can move it over there and we won't have to worry about it recondensing as much. So uh, that's why I just pre-chilled it down to 90C. But now we're about to move it over, get all those hops extracted, and then just uh, start knocking it out, which is basically just uh, chilling down the wort to fermentation temperatures and injecting oxygen into it so the yeast grow and start fermenting. I'm going to start moving it over now, and then uh, it'll start smelling good. I'm gonna move it over into that vessel, let it sit for 20 minutes probably, 15, 20 minutes, get it all extract and I'll start knocking it out. Send it all the way up there to the fermenter and then I get to clean up. This is a little weird of a brew day because we're like, typically this vessel right here, the mash tun, is just for mixing malted grains and hot water basically to activate enzymes to break down starches into sugars. But today we're using it again as a hot back. So usually we go for mash tun, get the sugar water, which we call wort, move it over to the kettle, boil it to sanitize it, add hops to bitter it basically. And then we usually just knock it out through the heat X over there, which brings it down to temperature. And then we inject oxygen afterwards, send it upstairs to the fermenter, get yeast and start fermenting. And then we'll dry hop it or add other flavoring depending on the beer. But today, instead of adding most of our hops in the boil kettle, we're adding them in the mash tun because we have so many of those like whole leaf hops, it's 200 pounds, so we don't really want to shove that all in the boil kettle. So we're moving it back over here to the mash tun so we can fit all the hops in there and like more easily extract the wet hops. And then from there, I'll go from the mash through the heat X and then knock it out upstairs. So today we're just adding an extra step to like fit in those 200 pounds of wet hops. It's a, it's a fun brew day once a year. I'm just trying to mix in the, the hops. So the liquid will just start floating them. So you have to like force them down into the liquid or else it just floats up. So we have to like mix in all of these, well, cones, I guess, into the, into the liquid so they can extract or else they just keep floating up. And they don't really mix very well, but you have to try to submerge them at least a little bit. Pretty well. Got like half of it over already. 
Yeah, you can start smelling like the aromas is extracting now. Volatilizing some of it because it gets hot and uh, aroma terpenes are fairly volatile. We'll get most of the aroma out of them. Often called the mushroom of the gods, lion's mane has a long history of medicinal use. This popular nootropic has been shown to enhance focus and increase cognition, helping you feel more productive and accomplished. Research studies have also shown that lion's mane is neuroprotective, giving you peace of mind as you power through your day. Try lion's mane and experience the mental clarity and productivity boost you've been missing. Let's see, they just kind of float to the top. Got them kind of worked in pretty well, but it's probably about as good as you'll get them. This will add about two and a half hours to the brew day today using these, but it's once a year, so it's not like the worst, but yeah, it's a, it's a long brew day. Just like having to use 200 pounds of hops instead of like maybe 14. So yeah, it's a, it's a nice change of pace though. I mean, you don't really get to use whole leaves very often. So it's always fun using the kind of I don't want to say traditional, but more like old school approach, I guess. So all that at the bottom is what we call true, which is basically coagulated proteins, denatured coagulated proteins, if you want to be correct. Then we're moving out all the sugar, the sugar off the top of it, basically, and then moving it over to the, that vessel. Get all the hops, let that sit, and then we'll knock it out from there through the heat exchanger and upstairs. So it starts with malted barley. I mean, mostly malted barley. You can use some wheat and oats. Uh, goes from like materials we come in, come in these uh, 25 kilo, 55 pound bags. Go in here, which is a two roll mill. We mill it, goes through the chain disc, back up there into the grist case. So it's a two roll mill, so it's a roll like that. It just cracks the grains basically to expose surface area for sugar, well, starch and sugars to come out of it. So we go through that, mill it to crack it. And then it goes through at the bottom there, it's called a chain disc, which then brings it like takes it up into the grist case, which is up front again. So it starts here with barley. We crack it open or mill it, move it up here into the grist case, which is up there, which is basically just a storage vessel for the milled barley. And from there, we go through a, a hydrator basically to like efficiently add water to it. It goes down in there, hit a ratio with water and grain. Basically it's making a big thing of oatmeal. That way the, uh, the starches, the amylose, amylose pectane will get worked on by the amylase enzymes in it, break that down into fermentable sugars. And then uh, with those fermentable sugars, we then move them over into the kettle, boil them and add hops to them. And then from there, we'll uh, cool it down from the kettle into the heat exchanger right here which basically passes cold water and the wort, which is what we call the sugar water. It's basically a radiator. It'll cool off the wort into a fermentation temperature, which is 20 C, mid 60s Fahrenheit. From there, then we go all the way upstairs into one of our fer fermentation vessels where uh, we'll add yeast and oxygen, and then it will ferment up there from a week to three weeks, depending on the beer. Um, we do have lagers, so a lot of those lagers ferment for up to three weeks, two and a half, three weeks, depending on the beer. So after fermentation, then we go into a bright tank for carbonation from the carbonation vessel back downstairs into keg. So it's kind of up and downstairs twice. Down here basically is all about sugar production. That's all we care about down here. Most of the time spent in brewing is all upstairs, which is like fermenting and conditioning, which is arguably more important than sugar creation because that's all like brew house hot side is all just sugar creation basically. We're making the precursor for the yeast to then ferment. I mean, it all, it all matters, but the fermentation is more characteristic of the beer, at least like personally speaking. I prefer doing cellar work at this point just cause it's like, it's more indicative of the final product, I guess. Like you can screw more things up as far as in the cellar, whereas in like brew house, like I don't want to say anyone can do it, but like it's it's kind of just processing. Like it's it's a little more mindless, I would say. But like cellar work, I like doing like uh, QA, QC stuff, but currently we don't do like a whole lot of that because we're so small. And I like to work with the like the yeast cells, I guess. 
we have a lot of hats here, so there's a lot of, a lot of aspects. But yeah, I like the micro side probably, or like the more science forward sector of it. Otherwise, it's just kind of like uh, processing, industrial processing, same as like most food production, but this is a little more, uh, it's a little more glorified at least. People care a little bit more about it than like making most other products. At least that's fun in any aspect of it. I don't know, outside of that, it's a lot of cleaning, so it's probably the worst part, but that's also the biggest and most important part. It's like being a janitor sometimes, like a, a fancy janitor. We are wet dry hopping a beard. In the realm of wet hopping being already kind of a lost art, we are taking that a step further by wet dry hopping. So uh, dry hopping is typically when you add hops in secondary, so you kind of saw we were using them on the hot side downstairs. This is the cold side up here in the cellar. Everything's at cooler temperatures. It affects the extraction and kind of the flavor compounds that we're going to get out of this, but we're using it in a beer that's already fully fermented. We're transferring it onto some of these uh, awesome wet hops we got in today, and it's kind of an experiment for us. We've never actually made this one before, so uh, we'll see how it turns out. So right now we're just taking the the wet hops that we were using downstairs and packing them into bags and suspending them inside of a fermentation vessel that we can transfer the beer onto and it'll basically sit on those hops for a couple of days and we'll just kind of taste it, see how, see where it's at along the, along the way and then decide when, uh, when it has a flavor that we want hopefully and we'll kind of transfer it along from there onto another, uh, another tank called a bright tank. So, and then it'll be, uh, this one will actually be out probably within a week or so. That'll be cool because we'll have a, a wet hop out in a, a week and then we'll have our other one that we're brewing downstairs today out in probably like three weeks. So we got some fresh hops that we just got in from uh, the Pacific Northwest today. They were harvested yesterday, so about as fresh as you can get in Arizona. They're Idaho 7, which is one of the more versatile hop varieties. These leaves are, are typically the vegetal matter that don't make it into a uh, normal beer. A lot of that's kind of doesn't contribute a lot of flavor. So a lot of the flavor compounds are actually contained in these little buds down in here. Uh, these are what are gonna give us a lot of our thiols and our different uh, flavor compounds that make it into our final beers. They'll take like the most flavorful compound portions and concentrate them into pellets. And so that's typically what we'll use in beer. A lot of these leaves and stuff are, are not really giving us much flavor. And also, in a beer, they're gonna soak up a lot of liquid, so it's kind of an inefficient ingredient, as is. But we're being inefficient today, and we're kind of going for the full hop, or the full money here, and uh, seeing what we get. Genetically, it's the closest relative to cannabis. Uh, from an aroma standpoint, you get a lot of the same kind of uh, aromas there, kind of skunky, like citrusy, um, Dank is a term that we use when describing hop uh, aromas, so it definitely has a dank characteristic to it. Citrus, pine, um, yeah, just like the skunky, funky, smelly green stuff here. They're nugs, they kind of look like cannabis nuggets. There's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities between, between these two things, which is, uh, a lot of cannabis users enjoy IPAs, uh, coincidentally. Typically on the day of filling, we'll swell the heads. They're typically the part of the barrel that ends, tends to dry up the fastest. Swelling them just prevents any potential leaks once we start to fill them. Uh, barrels actually aren't held together by anything but basically what you see. It's literally wooden staves that are have these uh, metal hoops on them and those hold them together. If, if they get dry, you can just kick one in, it'll fall apart. They're pretty temperamental, so we try to take a lot of uh, care ahead of time to make sure that the wood is swollen and uh, everything's ready to go for filling. Yeah, you can tell our, uh, our cellar operation is, it's like one of those puzzles where there's like one piece missing and you have to make the picture and you just have to shuffle everything around until the picture's right. That's what it feels like working up in this cellar with barrels and tanks and knocking out and everything all at once. So. Before beer had the technology that we have these days, the cellars were literally in caves underground or you know, underneath the ground to keep them naturally cool. Uh, luckily, now that we have like modern technology and 
glycol systems and uh, these tanks are double jacketed so that we can basically pump a food grade coolant through these at all times. We don't have to have the cellars underground anymore. They can be above ground on a second floor mezzanine. I mean, there's a lot of headaches involved with having a second floor cellar. The contradiction that it sounds like kind of plays itself out in real life, but beer is kind of about just like making things work. So take what you have and just do your best and see what, see what you can do with it. So yeah, we're just giving them uh, one last wetting before the fill. I don't know how effective it is, but just get them wet, you know, make sure the wood's as swollen as it's gonna be today before we start putting beer in these things. I know it's kind of satisfying just to rinse them down too, so. Give them one more wetting here. Like these come sealed from the distilleries that they originated in, just like this. So kind of the first step is pop all the bungs and give them a quick inspection, make sure everything looks good inside. You don't see any like, it'd be very rare, but some type of mold or something else that looks off inside of the barrels. Um, we also refer to barrels as being wet, which means there's still some residual spirit inside. So we need to make sure the environment inside is good. Technically, you're not really supposed to fill them if there's uh, liquor in there, you're supposed to dump it out. So we will dump it out if there is any. See, I usually just kind of give it a look. Everything looks good in there. Give it a nice whip. Funny part is this is called a bunghole. There's endless jokes you can make about bungholes, but you gotta give the bunghole a little sniff. Make sure it smells good. This is actually a mezcal barrel from Mexico. And it is wet, meaning that there is a little bit of mezcal in there. So we'll dump that out before we fill it. With 10 different mushroom species packed into the most delicious gummies you've ever tried, this bottle has it all, including favorites like maitake, shiitake, lion's mane, reishi, and cordyceps. You'll experience a powerful blend of beneficial compounds that support healthy cognition and increased energy levels. These gummies are of the highest quality and efficacy, making them the perfect choice for anyone looking to perform at their best. Designed for a productive lifestyle, it's the easiest way to include all the benefits of mushrooms in your day. Another mezcal barrel, another wet barrel. Bung smells good. And then at this point, I'll actually start to purge the barrels as well. So we got our little CO2 hose there. And this is gonna allow us to get all the oxygen out of the barrels before we put beer in there. Oxygen is the enemy of beer after fermentation, so we'll get all that out before we fill them. And we'll just keep moving down the line. One thing people don't realize about spirits is they're aged in barrels at a lot higher proof than they end up in the bottle. So the flavors are a lot more aggressive when they come out of a, when you get a fresh spirit barrel because they probably sit in there at about 130, 140 proof. And then they get proof down to the uh, strength at which they serve it. So they're really intense aromas. Which also leads to really intense flavors, which that's what we're going for. Yeah, we're eight for eight, that's good news. Uh, we're actually dealing with some nice higher end bourbon barrels, so they're taken care of a little better, which is always good. Sometimes they just punch these bungs through and you look inside and there'll be like four old bungs in there and these are all nice. They got these fancy name plates and everything. During uh, fermentation, as the yeast is going through metabolizing the sugars, 
doing what it does. Uh, one of the byproducts of that is CO2 gas. So if you've ever seen a home brewer, that's got a little airlock, little bubbles coming out of it. This is basically just like a bigger version of that. So as it's creating alcohol and, and heat, it's also shooting off CO2 gas. So during an active fermentation, you'll see these bubbles rolling for typically like five to seven days while it's uh, still active. So we brewed this beer yesterday. The pitch is just starting to take off. It's just starting to do work. Uh, it's dropped about two Play-Dohs since it was inoculated last evening. About 18 hours in and we're seeing a nice healthy fermentation, which is what we want at this stage. And then by tomorrow, this thing will be rolling. These things will be splashing all over the place and it'll just be chugging along at that point. Inoculation is a fancy term for adding yeast to beer. Um, it just means uh, pitching our yeast into the beer, which basically initiates the fermentation process. And within that process, there's a few phases that it goes through, but inoculation is when it starts and then it kind of just goes through that five to seven day fermentation process. Well, sometimes people don't quite comprehend the full process of brewing, but it doesn't happen all in one day or even at one time. There's actually steps and stages that it goes through throughout the process. So like we have the hot side downstairs and that's most of the mashing, boiling, uh, hops are started to be added at that stage. And then as it gets sent up here to the cold side and the fermentation in our cellar with our fermentation tanks, bright tanks, that's when it's actually gonna go through the uh, fermentation process like you're seeing here. And then it will get uh, clarified through a few different processes, which gives us a bright beer that we can move into a tank where it goes to get carbonated. And at that point, it's ready to go into package, either a keg, a can, uh, whatever, uh, that we will basically serve it direct to consumers, their accounts. So CO2 gas is actually more dense than oxygen. So naturally, when you mix the two together, CO2 is gonna settle to the bottom and push oxygen up. So as it purges, it's actually creating a layer of CO2 and then increasing that layer and pushing oxygen out, 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 out until it's just completely purged of oxygen. And it's fairly efficient because, like I said, the densities are different, so they naturally separate. If you put oxygen and CO2 in a room, oxygen will go to the top, CO2 will settle at the bottom, which makes it a dangerous gas to work with if you're in a confined area. Obviously, you could get CO2 trapped. We take a lot of precautions to keep open air and make sure that there's a lot of movement so that we don't create a dangerous environment. The gas actually takes the shape of whatever container it's in. As it goes into this barrel, it's going to naturally settle in the rounded bottom and just basically create a separated layer between the CO2 and the oxygen. And as it moves up and as we add more CO2 gas and the oxygen vents out of this bunghole, it'll basically just continue to adapt to the container that it's in as it rises up and just completely purge this vessel of any oxygen naturally. Got to do a little uh, on the fly manipulation here. Luckily these are empty. All right, that bunghole's a little out of reach, so now we're good. So purging is a huge process in the brewery. After fermentation, oxygen is one of our biggest enemies. So we've already purged this entire line that leads up to our tank that we'll be filling from. Now I'm going to move the beer through the line. As we move it, we'll apply top pressure, which is more CO2, just ensuring that it's uh, pushing everything with, with CO2. There's no oxygen involved at all, but it'll apply a little bit of pressure to the top of the tank and just push the liquid down and out and through our, our uh, racking hose here. So now we've opened our tank. It kind of flows through this line and I'm checking to make sure that the beer is fairly clear. As yeast ages, it actually settles out. And that's why these vessels are all conically shaped. It's a natural way to 
collect the yeast and either harvest it for reuse or get it out of the beer. As you first start to run it, there might be a little bit of residual yeast left towards the bottom of the tank. And so I just wanna make sure that we don't get that into the barrel. Um, over time, that will cause a process called an autolysis where the yeast cells die. And uh, as part of a self-preservation technique, they'll actually explode naturally, hoping to save the rest of the yeast colony by spilling their guts out so that they can maybe eat some of their guts and survive. Uh, but those guts don't taste good and we don't want those in the beer. So make sure we don't get any yeast into these barrels because this beer is going to sit in here for anywhere from eight to 12 months. So that gut spilling will definitely happen. And then I just spray with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol, which is a very effective sanitizer. Just to make sure that everything's clean. Barrel wand goes in and we can start our process of filling. So now we're actively filling this tank. The beer is jet oil black, which is another thing we like to see. Our Imperial Stouts are real dark, real roasty, but it helps kind of balance out the flavors. When creating a good beverage, it's all about balance. It's all about counteracting flavors with other flavors that, that when combined, they create a rounded palate. So, Alcohol has a very strong flavor. Uh, we counterbalance that in stouts with roastiness and sweetness of the malt. The ending gravity of a barrel-aged beer is a lot higher than any other type of beer, meaning that there's more residual sugar left in solution when it goes into a barrel. So it's gonna be sweeter by nature. That's intentional because there's so much flavor and so much alcohol and such a complexity of basically flavor profiles going on that that helps to counterbalance the end product as well. This barrel will fill for a couple minutes as we're doing that. We're gonna to continue to purge our other barrels so they're all ready to go. And so on and so forth. Kinda of keep an eye on them, see where they're going. Another part of barrel aging is that there's always gonna be a little bit of CO2 that stays in solution after fermentation. So you see it bubble out through those airlock arms, but the, since it is a dense solution, it traps some CO2. So they get a little foamy as they get transferred into here from a contained environment to an open environment. So we get a little bit of breakout from that CO2 trap in solution. So we wanna make sure we don't fill too fast or too slow because that agitates the CO2 to break out more or less, which causes more foam. More foam means more loss. And so we're trying to minimize the amount of loss we have in this process. So you just kind of keep an eye on the barrel, make sure that it's filling at a reasonable rate and we're not gonna lose a ton of beer down the drain from this whole thing. So another important process, step in the process is to always try the beer before it goes into barrel. You don't wanna fill these thousands of dollars of of nice oak whiskey barrels with bad beer. So we've been tasting it throughout the whole fermentation, and uh, but it's always good, last thing to do, just to take one more sample and make sure that everything's good, taste how you want to taste. And It's a thick boy, I can tell you that. Roasty, sweet, you taste the alcohol burn, and it'll make a nice barrel-aged beer in about eight months when we pull it out. So yeah, we look pretty good. Not a ton of breakout, which means not a huge amount of foam. There's always gonna be some. In the same sense of purging, we'll kind of purge the barrels till you see liquid. That way you know the entire barrel is all the way full. Kind of do that, minimize the... You see foam at first and then liquid. That's what we want. Kind of let it top off so it's all the way full. Make sure there's no oxygen in there and we'll actually move right on to the next barrel that's already been purged and get that guy going. And then with this, make sure the bung's sanitized one more time. Pop it in. We got a full barrel of stout.
leave it on there a little loose at first just to make sure if it wants to vent some of that CO2, it won't pop it out. Yeah, so basically we purge this barrel with CO2 gas and you can kind of see it uh, just venting as we're filling it with liquid. Now the liquid's purging the CO2 back out of the barrel after we use the CO2 to purge the oxygen. So it's kind of a three-stage process. First eliminating the oxygen and then basically eliminating the CO2 gas as we replace it with the beer. So you'll see most of our vessels here are cone shaped or conical shaped. Um, that allows the yeast as it flocculates, which is another term we use when talking about fermentation. Inoculation being when the yeast is first introduced to start the fermentation. At the end of fermentation, when the yeast cells uh, have done their job, there's no more sugars to eat, and they kind of get lazy. They like to clump together, and, and when they clump together, they obviously get heavier and they, they fall to the bottom of the tank. So this tank is conically shaped, so as the yeast flocculates, clumps together, and falls out, it'll naturally fall down into this funnel that allows us to either harvest the yeast or get it out of the beer. We like to harvest our yeast because they're actually still healthy and viable, and so we can take the yeast straight out of this beer when it's done fermenting and put it into the next beer, and it'll just keep working and keep fermenting, um, which is a really cool thing with beer, and it's a lot of fun to do that, and it saves you a lot of money. Uh, in the long run, because instead of having to pitch yeast with every time you brew a beer, we're able to harvest the first generation of this yeast and use it for several more generations uh, following that first pitch. So uh, that's one of the ways that we like to kind of reduce uh, and, and save some money and, and be more efficient on the brew side up here. We also monitor viability of yeast, which is basically when we uh, harvest it from the, from the fermenter, we'll go and look at it under a microscope and using dyes, we can tell how many of the yeast cells are alive or dead. And then we calculate a viability percentage, which basically tells us it's 98% viable, meaning 98% of the yeast cells are alive. Like I said, when they die, they tend to spill their guts, which, which basically ruptures their, their cell wall, meaning when we add some dye, the dye will insert into the cell. So those cells will become saturated with dye. And when we go look at it under our microscope, you can tell which cells are alive and which cells are dead by doing that process that determines our viability. As continuous generations of yeast go on, it kind of has a sweet spot of like generation three to four, and that's gonna depend on the yeast strain as well. But uh, that's when it it's the most viable, and then you might see some decline in viability on further generations. At a certain point, it won't be uh, viable enough for us to reuse, and at that point, we'll just dump it and start a fresh pitch again. So we're about full again. So yeah, I always go till I see just nice dark beer. So this one we're getting a little more breakout. Meaning, I should adjust my back pressure. You know, at the end of the day, as a small independently owned brewery. It's David versus Goliath. And, but our ability to be creative and stay relevant is what keeps us coming back to work every day. Just trying to push the limits and push the boundaries of beer and see what we can do and art versus science and creating what we do. Here you can see like as we get into the bourbon barrels, this is literally barrel char. We don't actually pass it through a filter, but we, through like a settling process, and then we use some like inline filtration, which we call them sock filters, but it's kind of like a fine mesh that we pass it through that everything ends up getting out of it. Plus it'll be transferred to a tank with a conical bottom and then transferred to another tank with a conical bottom. Things settle out, we're able to clarify, rack those off, and when it's all said and done, but you know, chunks and things in your beer aren't always a bad thing. Sometimes that just means it's more raw. At the end of the day, we're working with three different types of spirit barrels here. Uh, we have Mezcal, which is obviously an agave spirit. Um, then we have rye whiskey, which is similar to bourbon, but uh, the, the grain bill in that consists of a higher percentage of rye, which has kind of a spicy note to it. And then we have two different types of bourbon, Rebel Yell and Ezra 
Brooks, which are both uh, pretty reputable brands. When it comes time to taste these barrels and make our final decisions on the blends, we'll actually pull samples from each, sample them next to each other, and decide, do these go together well? If, if uh, depending on what we're going for, like this is intended to be a Mexican chocolate stout, so it's gonna have chilled spin peppers, cinnamon, cassia bark, vanilla beans, cacao, kind of creating a complex flavor, but we don't want it to be overly sweet. So if some of these barrels are tasting sweeter, uh, maybe we'll save it for our German chocolate cake stout blend, which we also do annually. Uh, we also do a morning grind, which is an imperial breakfast stout with maple syrup, coffee. And so we'll kind of make decisions on the fly when we come to tasting and decide, do these barrels go together? And we'll kind of create the blend based off what barrels go best for the style we're going after. For us, when we talk about adjuncts, we're talking about added flavors besides kind of just the beer and barrel. Adjuncts can also mean other types of grains besides barley, but for us in adjuncted stouts, we're talking about cacao, vanilla, cinnamon, uh, those types of flavors, maple syrup, coffee. We do, you know, all types of different things. Bananas even. We have a Bananarchy beer that is a barrel-aged banana chocolate stout. Those are what we refer to as adjuncts when we're kind of adding additional flavors and creating our different flavor profiles that we're going for in these beers. And we actually do all that naturally. Uh, we don't use any extracts or any types of other um, fake flavorings. We use all real ingredients. We use real bananas, we use real chocolate, where cacao, which is the precursor to chocolate. We use actual cassia bark and cinnamon sticks, real whole vanilla beans, which are hard to come by these days because there's been a vanilla shortage. Uh, but we still buy them at an elevated cost just to keep all the flavors in our beers as authentic to the real thing as possible. We found like over time that you can't replicate the real thing and people try, but it's just gonna taste fake. If you use a banana extract, it's gonna taste like runts. If you, if you try to use vanilla extract, it's gonna taste like alcohol kind of, or just kind of a fake cloying vanilla flavor. But vanilla bean has like a super earthy, genuinely like unreplaceably unique flavor that you only get from vanilla beans. And so when going after world-class beers and making the best beers that we can, and that's what we strive to do is just make the best beers in the world, we have to use world-class ingredients. And that's, you know, that's it at the end of the day. So that's what we do. So we had a really good day here today. Um, we got our wet hop beer brewed, which, you know, those hops got overnighted last night. So we got those into our uh, so fresh and so green. Uh, we also got our wet hop, dry hop beer into a tank. So now it's aging on an additional kind of hop addition of, of new fresh hops. And uh, we got all these barrels filled. So uh, now this beer that we brewed today, so fresh and so green, is gonna sit in this tank for about two to three weeks uh, as it goes through its fermentation and then flocculation and uh, clarifying processes. And at that point, we'll move it along and try to get it out as quick as possible. The thing about IPAs is they're always better fresh. So the quicker we can get this beer into the mouths of our customers, the better. So we'll, we'll keep a real keen eye on this and monitor its activity really closely. And as soon as we can move it along and move it to that next stage in the process, we're gonna do that. And we're gonna keep it uh, so that it can be as fresh and green in our product, in our customers' mouths basically as we can get it. Um, Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoy our documentaries as much as we enjoy making them. Unfortunately, many of our videos don't earn enough YouTube revenue to afford the cost of production. But if you like our content, the best thing you can do is directly support it on Patreon. Plus, you'll get access to behind the scenes vlogs and commentary. If you're looking for something more in return, go to paragraphic.io where you can buy our other products and services. Alternatively, you can shop our Amazon storefront for our favorite equipment recommendations. Also, check out Boca where you can find beneficial supplements to optimize your productivity. We especially love the lion's mane and mushroom gummies. And finally, consider signing up to Multitude, a platform built for long form content where you and other content creators can share and monetize new videos every week.